far above the heaven and the earth and the sea and the dry land and all that is in them. We are your creatures, great and small. And we come to you, Father, as the one who has made us, redeemed us, and is coming back for us. Would you forgive us for this week? We have not lived like that at times. We have been selfish and self-centered. We have been fleshly and worldly. We ask for your cleansing so that you would open the eyes of our hearts to understand the greatness of your great love for us and this wonderful privilege and gift of prayer that you have given to us. And so we pray, Father, for your ministry, your Holy Spirit to enlighten us during this brief time together. And these things we pray in the name of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, we are talking about prayer, if you can see behind the keyboard here. Prayer is uh, probably one of the most essential aspects of the Christian life, isn't it? And it's found everywhere throughout the Scriptures. Uh, when you look at the garden, for instance, Adam and Eve, they had this communion with God. They could fellowship with Him and talk with Him at any time. So prayer, as we know it, didn't exist really in the garden where God was somewhere else and, and we talked to Him, but He was right there with them. But sin interrupted that communion. But in time, God was working in His people, and men began to call upon the name of the Lord, and we see everyone in all of the Old Testament call upon the name of the Lord, men and women of God talking to God, conversing with Him. That's prayer throughout the Scriptures. David's prayers, some of them are recorded for us in the book of Psalms, and they're fantastic. Solomon's prayers are recorded for us, and some of those are amazing. And, and if you want to learn how to really pray, read the prayers of Scripture. They really do teach us how we should pray. But we see prayer everywhere. And I think the one who has probably told, taught us the most about prayer is the last Adam, Jesus Christ himself. He taught us the necessity, the priority of prayer for himself. He demonstrated that to us in example. I think one of my favorite stories about Jesus and prayer comes right at the beginning of his ministry in the book of Mark in chapter 1. He just starts and he has this, this full day. He's, he's casting out demons. He is uh, teaching people. He is healing people late into the night. He must have been physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. Yes, he was God, but he was also a man. And he must have been exhausted working late into the night. And then it says, early the next morning, while it was still dark, he got up and went to a lonely place to pray. Wow. If that's what Jesus did, if that's what he needed, how much more do we need that? Elsewhere, he would say, I can't do anything on my own initiative. He made it very clear that everything that he did was in dependence upon his Father, and he often talked to his Father. Jesus, the Son of God, if he prayed like that, how much more important is it for us? Second, he taught us how to pray. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount... He said, when you pray, he didn't say if you pray, he says, when you pray, don't be like the Gentiles do, don't, don't pray your righteousness before men, go into secret and pray, uh, don't use meaningless rep rep uh, repetition, and his disciples in another place said, Lord, teach us to pray, and he said, pray this way. In fact, I want you to stand, and we're going to pray how he has taught us. We've just sung it, but let's pray this this morning. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Some of you grew up in a church where you said that prayer, probably different words, there are various variations of it. But it's important that we pray as Jesus taught us. And one of the things that he said to us up till now, he said, you have asked for nothing in my name, ask 
and it will be given to you that your joy may be made full. God delights in answering prayer. So he says, ask and you will receive and your joy will be made full. He is a, a loving father who wants to do for us those things that we cannot do for ourselves. As important as prayer is, and we believe it's important, I don't think there is any one of us here this morning that thinks that we have it wired. In fact, we're all a little bit uncomfortable talking about prayer, aren't we? Because we all know our deficiencies when it comes to this, myself included. But I want to tell you about the vision that we have for prayer as the leadership of Valley Bible Church. Our elders, our pastors, we want to be a praying church. Jesus, when he, before he cleared the temple, quoting the prophet Isaiah, he said, My house shall be called a house of what? House of prayer. At that time, the house was the temple. What is the house today? We are the household of God. It's not this. We shall be called a household of prayer. We are to be a people of prayer. And we believe that as elders, that that is a, an essential part of who we are and what we do as a church. Prayer is essential to, to a valley Bible church. It's amazing that um, for the second time in three years, we came back from a leadership retreat. Second time in three years, we came back and our priority was this, prayer. I'm not sure how well we did two years ago. <laughs> but for the second time in three years, we decided that prayer was to be a priority for Valley Bible Church. In, in 2017, knowing that prayer was a priority, we asked this question, well, what should we be praying about as a church? What should we as Valley Bible Church be asking God for? And what we came up with was our Valley Bible Church prayer. Some of you still have those bookmarks. I have to admit to you that we probably did not inculcate that into the life of the church like we should have, but we want to. And that prayer is very simple. It is taking, taken from the, 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 the prayers of the Apostle Paul. These are some of the prayers, parts of prayers that he gave in different places. Gratitude, godliness, the gospel and glory. Gratitude, we should be people of thanksgiving. We thank you, God, for the grace which was given us in Christ Jesus and for your, our fellowship and the saints. We should be people who are always grateful to God for what he's done for us. Godliness, we pray for godliness and righteousness and holiness as a, as a people. And this we pray, that our love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, strengthened with His glorious might for the, the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. We should always be praying for growth in godliness and holiness. And for the gospel from Ephesians, that you will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak the mystery of the gospel with boldness. We should be praying for the gospel to spread. And ultimately, we should be praying for God's glory. And that's in our passage this morning. To you be the glory in our church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's the Valley Bible Church prayer. It's really not our prayer, is it? It's Paul's prayers. But it's a prayer that we would like to pray as a church on a regular basis. And of course we pray. We pray in our services. We, we take prayer requests and the connection cards. We have a prayer team. The elders are committed to pray. We pray in our life groups. We can do better. We can do better. We came back from this last leadership retreat just last month. Elders and pastors and our wives, the, the staff and their spouses, the deacons were with us for a one, one day. And we came back once again with this priority prayer. And this time, we, we defined it more, uh, more directly as corporate prayer. We want to pray together. We want to learn how to pray as a church in our worship ser services that we include prayer in a, more, uh, a, a way that is more effective. In our life groups that we pray, the, the life groups are basically, our life group meeting ha basically has three pillars, and that is Bible study, fellowship, and prayer, those three things. You can't leave prayer out. 
cannot leave prayer out of our life groups. It's not just taking requests. It is praying together and learning how to pray together. We have a prayer team, like I said, and we want to do better with our prayer team. And I'll talk about that later on. Our vision is to have prayer events throughout the the year that are significant. Just like we know that we're going to have vacation Bible school. We we know we're going to have fall flare. We know life groups are going to start up. We know that we're going to have Advent and we're going to have Easter. We want to make sure that in the warp and the woof of Valley Bible Church in the year as we worship Him, that we have these events of prayer that are worked into the life of the church. And we look forward to them. And we participate in them as a church family. And of course, we want to help you to learn how to pray in private because if we learn how to pray in private, we will pray together corporately more effectively as well. So what are the benefits to this? Why why would we do this? The first is this. We will grow closer to Christ together. When we pray together, we grow closer together. And when you pray with your spouse, you grow closer together. When you pray with your family, when you pray with your life group, as we pray together as a church, we want to grow together closer to Christ. We will also grow closer to Christ individually. Um, Everyone has to learn how to pray. And if you're a new believer, maybe you're not sure how to do that. But we want to help you. We want everyone to learn how to pray to Christ together and to grow closer to Him. Third, we want to um, invite God to do His work in our midst. That's what prayer is, saying, God, would you come? Would you bring your blessings? Would you do things that will bring glory to your name? And we want to be able to do that. We want to um, invite God to work among, among us because God delights in answering prayer. He really does. I know many of you are thinking, well, he never answers my prayers. Sometimes he says no. But he does delight in answering prayers. Jesus said, till now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. He really does want you to be joyful. He really does want to answer your prayers. And so we want to see that happen ultimately so that God is glorified and we can say these are the answers, these are the things that God has done, these are the things that He is doing in our midst and this is the God that we serve and we worship Him better, more accurately because we see Him as He is a glorious God. Now last week we began this series, A Church Glorious, and this morning we're going to talk about A Prayer Glorious. This prayer from Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21, a prayer glorious. And basically what I want you to know is this. Our prayers will be fueled by a passion for God's glory. If we are driven as a church to the glory of God, it is going to fuel our prayers. It is going to incite our prayers. It is going to encourage us to pray more and more. So our prayers will be fueled by this passion for the glory of God, which should be the passion of every believer, certainly the passion of every church. So Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, we're actually going to be looking at this, um, at this passage for most of the summer. Last week, uh, when Chris began his message, he actually prayed this rather than reading it. And uh, as we go through this passage the next few weeks, if you happen to notice, well, how come you didn't mention this or how, how come you didn't mention that? This morning, we're just talking about prayer, okay? Would you stand? I've changed the pronouns. We're going to pray again. And we're going to pray Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21. Would you pray with me? We bow our knees before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that you would grant us, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through your Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, 
that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to you who are able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to you be the glory in our church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. That is a prayer. It's a prayer we should learn how to pray, just like the Valley Bible Church prayer, praying right from Scripture. And as we see that prayer, I want you to know some things this morning. And the first thing I want to help you to understand this morning is this. I want you to remember to whom your prayers are directed. Remember to whom your prayers are directed. Paul said, we bow our knees before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Who's he praying to? The Father. It's pretty obvious. It's pretty simple. Remember to whom you're praying, but it's not really that obvious. It's not always that simple because sometimes our focus is on requests and not upon the Father. Have that that happened to you? You're praying for a lot of stuff, Do you ever forget who you're talking to, who you're addressing? It can happen. We get involved in the mechanics of prayer. I was reading a book. um, It's called The Praying Life, and the author was saying this. He was talking about how prayer is conversing with God and, and this relationship that we have with Him, this communion. And sometimes when we're talking to God, we we get focused on the conversation itself instead of the person. We, we get focused on the conversation instead of the person. And he said it's like driving in a car with a windshield, and you're looking at the windshield instead of where you're going. And that could be dangerous, right? And sometimes prayer is that way because we, we sometimes get caught up looking at the mechanics of prayer and the, the, the way in which we're praying instead of to whom we are speaking. It seems like a, 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 a subtle difference. It is, but it's very, very important. He bows his knees to the Father. We address our God as Father. And we are sometimes more about the mechanics than we are talking to God himself. Now, mechanics are important. I mean, um, how you order your prayers, you know, what you should pray for, what you shouldn't pray for, yeah, they're important. But but we want to make sure that uh, they, 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 they help us to know God better. They help us to, to focus on who He is and on the Father. There, there are many uh, mechanical things that, happen, that go along with prayer. For instance, language. Um, what kind of language do you use? And for new Christians, they don't know. They hear other people pray and they go, I can't pray like that. Do you remember being a new believer? I do remember being a new believer and hearing these older saints saying, Thou art God ensconced in heaven, and thou art forever, you know, and I'm, would you like to pray, Ben? Ah! I don't know what to say. I don't know how to do that. By the way, if you grow up praying that way, and if that's the way you pray, pray, if that's the way you approach God to show Him deference and fear and adoration, fine, don't change that. In fact, I I think that's a beautiful way to address the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But don't let language get in the way of addressing the Father. It is just talking to God. There's language and then there's structure. Um, Well, where do you start? Do Do I start by saying I'm sorry? Do I start by saying, God, give me stuff? Where do you start in your prayers? How do you order your prayers and structure? Um, one of the most well-known structures that many of you probably use is ACTS, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. The, the problem with um, alliterations and acrostics is they, they have to be forced. I don't know of any prayers in the, in the Bible that really follow that that order, adoration, confession, then... Uh, so anyway, you, you can spell it differently. The, the, the important, important thing is this, that you are not driven by the structure, that the structure does not get in the way of you praying to God and talking to the Father, praising Him, confessing your sin, 
and asking Him to do things. Is, is, that's all prayer is. And it, prayer should include all of those things. And as you grow as a Christian, learn to pray the way the Scriptures demonstrate to us, but don't be a slave to the structure. And then there's posture. I, I, are you supposed to close your eyes when you pray? Guys, do you close your eyes when you talk to your wife? Or is it just your ears that are closed? Do you have to close your eyes? Should, can, can you have them open? Are you supposed to bow your head? Does the Bible say that? Are you supposed to fold your hands? Can you stand up and pray? Can you pray when you're walking or running or cooking? Yes. But don't get hung up on the posture. Well, I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. But, but we need to understand that there are many ways of praying with our eyes closed, eyes open, standing, hands raised to the Lord, flat on our faces, sitting. And then there's timing. Um, when should you pray? Oh, I forgot to pray this morning. Am I going to heaven? Can you pray at night? Can you pray at lunchtime? When do you pray? Uh, you can pray anytime. And I think it's important that you pray as much as you can, but you can pray anytime. And should I pray before meals? Yeah, I was, when I was uh, in my 20s, I was in a music group, went to the Netherlands, stayed in homes with some people. You know when they pray for a meal? After the meal. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because <laughs> you survived it, I guess. <laughs> You're great, <laughs> grateful that you made it through. But... Uh, Timing, don't get caught up on the timing. Well, I forgot to pray this morning, so God must not be happy with me today. You can pray at any time. How about the frequency? Do you have to pray every day? Twice a day? Three times a day? Is once a week okay? Probably not. I think we should pray more frequently than not, shouldn't we? But don't get hung up on keeping score of how many times you prayed throughout a day or throughout a week. Just pray. And just address the Father. Don't forget to whom you are speaking. Then there are certain helps um, lists. Um, here's the list from last week's uh, prayer request. You can use uh, devotionals. I've got a devotional that I use. You can use prayer journals. You can use the VBC prayer. You can use all sorts of things, right? But what can happen? This can become the windshield these requests, and I confess to you, sometimes I pray these lists, and I'm thinking more about the list than I am about God. Remember to whom you are speaking when you pray. These are all good tools to help you to pray deeply and more intimately with the Lord, but be careful that you're not a slave to those things. They are very good. Now, Paul said, I bow my knees before the Father. It's important that he use that language, by the way. It's a figure of speech at this point because he wasn't really bowing his knees. He was writing this when he, when he, said, when he, when he, when he said this. But do you think he really bowed his knees when he prayed for the Ephesians? Yeah. I really think that he knelt down and prayed for them. And so just a, a note on prayer posture like so many things in the, in the Christian life, we can fall off either side of the horse, right? Some people say, well, um, posture is not important at all because God is more concerned with the attitude of your heart. And then there are others who say, no, posture is everything because it is indicative of the attitude of your heart. So which is true? Both are true in some regard. Yeah, the Lord says that he is more concerned with what's in a man. But when he said that, he, was, he wasn't talking about prayer. He was talking about the character of Saul. And we can pray anytime in any way. Posture can be an indication of our heart attitude. But remember, sometimes you can't pray in a certain way. I think we should look at the Scriptures to see, well, how do we pray then? What are some of the, the, way, the ways that are, that are described in Scripture? We see people standing to pray, and sometimes their hands are upraised. We don't see people, people doing that much, but that's, that's one of the most typical postures of prayer in the Scripture. There is prostrate before the Lord on your face. That's a very common description of people praying in the Scriptures. 
they're sitting. And I only found there's only one place that I know of in the Bible where someone is described to be praying while they're sitting. And it's in 2 Samuel chapter 7, right after the, uh, the Lord made the Davidic covenant with David. And it says, David went and he sat down and prayed. That's the only example that I have. In some cultures, by the way, it's considered rude to pray sitting down. It does not show deference to God. And then kneeling is probably the, the, the one that we understand. When, he, when Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, we know right away what he's talking about. We know he's saying, I'm praying for you. Why didn't he just say, I pray for you? Because the reason he said, I bow my knees before the Father was it's a typical posture of prayer, and he was emphasizing to whom he was praying. I bow my knees before the Father. For us, an application is this. Talk to your Father this week. Talk to your Father this week. Tell Him you love Him. Thank Him for His love for you. Get out of the way, get the other things out of the way, and just talk to your Father. Keep it simple. Keep it pure and sincere. And lovingly talk to your loving Father because He's there and He wants to commune with you, and you can. So remember to whom your prayers are directed. Another thing I would like you to learn from this passage is this. Align your prayers to the priorities of God. Align your prayers to the priorities of God. God has certain priorities and and purposes, and, and there's an emphasis in this prayer. I want to read the prayer to you again. It's in verses 16 through 19. We'll put it on the screen. And as I read it to you, I want you to I want you to do this. I want you to think about you know what is the tenor of this prayer? What is the tone? What is Paul getting at? What is he saying? What is he really praying for the Ephesians? What does he want to get across? And here is what he says. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints What is the breadth and length and height and depth? And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Do you catch the spirit of that prayer? Do you catch the level that he is praying at? I want you to notice what he did not pray for. He did not pray for the the Ephesian church's budget to be met for the fiscal year. He did not pray for the fall outreach for the Ephesians church. He did not pray that they would complete their five-year facility plan. He did not pray that they would reach their attendance goals. He did not pray for the, a safe journey for the elders from uh, Ephesus who would go to Miletus to meet him, and they would do that. He didn't pray for that safe journey. He didn't pray for the current spate of colds and flu going through, through the, the church, that there would be healing. He didn't pray for those people in the church in Ephesus who are having problems with their jobs and their finances, that they would get new bosses and win the lottery. Is it okay to pray for any of those things? Maybe not the last one, but... (laughs) Yes, it's okay. We are told to pray specifically. Until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, Jesus said. And he wants us to pray specifically so that we will receive specifically, so that we we can praise God specifically for his answers to prayer. But notice the level of prayer that is different than most of our prayers. We're all about the list. And it's okay to pray the list, 
But we should add to that list something that is greater and something that is deeper. There is a higher level of prayer that Paul is praying here. It is for eternal things, things that last. He prays for spiritual strength by the Holy Spirit. He prays that Christ would be at home and known in their lives. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, he says. This is, this is back to the book of Exodus. God would come and dwell in their midst in the New Testament. He does in the form of Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit who mediates the presence of Christ in our lives. And he should be experienced and known. There should be some evidence that he is in our life. He prayed that their lives would be characterized by love, rooted and grounded in love. He uses two different words. One is is an agricultural term, one is a, a building term, rooted in love, but established and grown up in love. Their lives should be characterized by love itself. And then he prays that they would comprehend the incomprehensible. He says that you would know with all the saints, the height and depth and length and breadth, of the love of Christ that surpasses understanding. How can you comprehend something that, you, that can't be understood? It isn't that we can't understand God's love, <clears throat> it's that we can't understand all of it. But he's praying that they would ever be growing in a, in a fuller understanding of the love of Christ. And the last thing he prays is that they would be filled to the full maturity of godliness, that you may be filled up with God. He's talking about maturity. He's praying for the Ephesians, that they would grow spiritually by the Spirit in Christ, knowing God's love, loving one another, and become mature. That's another level of, give me a safe journey. It's another level than, help me to get over this cold. Those things we should pray for, but these are timeless principles. They can be prayed for anyone in any situation, at any time. You can pray for anyone, those things, regardless of what they're going through. How? Just pray these things for someone as you are praying for the requests. The application for us is this. Talk to your father this week on behalf of others. Yes, yeah, just talk to your father. But talk to him about other people. You know what I mean, in a good sense. Talk to the Father on behalf of others. And pray for them, Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. Pray for them these things. In fact, you could could memorize very easily verses 16 through 19. And you can pray for someone who is going, going on a trip to Minnesota. Give them a safe journey, Lord. But would you help them to grow? Would you, help, would you grow their faith during this time? Would you draw them closer to you? Would you give them opportunities for the gospel? Would you help them to grow in love? Would you help them to mature by all the experiences they have in traveling to Minnesota or the surgery this week or the illness that they're in or the financial difficulties? You see how you can pray these things in addition to the list in addition to the list. You can memorize this prayer, and I encourage you to do so. Pray to the Father. Remember to whom you're speaking. And pray, align your prayers with the the purposes of God, the priorities of God. What What are His priorities? Yes, His priority is that you have a safe journey. Yes, He wants to help you with your illness. Yes, He wants to help you with your finances. But consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials because God is working in you godliness, maturity. There's something greater that He's doing besides the answer to that specific thing on the list. He's working for a spiritual, eternal purpose. And our prayers should be in line with that as well. The last thing we can learn from this, and I encourage you to do this morning, is pray to the scale of God's glory. Pray to the scale of God's glory. He says in verse 20, Now to him 
to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. He starts out by saying, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. This is not hyperbole. This is true. God can do what you ask. He can do more than what you ask. He can do far more than what you ask. He can do far more abundantly than what you ask. Or even whatever you could dream up, you cannot even dream up what He could do. This is not hyperbole, it is true. And so our prayer should be to that scale, to what He can do. Do you understand what we're saying? To the proportion of what God can do. You could ask me to do things for you, and there are certain things I could do, but I can't do the scale of what God can do. God can do, we, we should scale our prayers according to the, the immense power and love and wisdom and glory of God, rather than our own scale, right? What we think He could accomplish. Because He can always do more than what we think He could accomplish. Always. Back to to verse 16 in chapter 3, he said this, when he began the prayer, that he would grant you, a very key phrase, according to the riches of his glory. That's the scale. That's the proportion. The riches of his glory. When we went through the book of Ephesians a number of years ago, the theme for us of the book was, His glory, our riches. His glory, our riches. And this, this phrase, the, the glory, the riches of His glory, comes in the first prayer in chapter 1 in Ephesians, and it comes in the second prayer in chapter 3. According, in other words, our prayers are according to the standard of God's glory, not our standard, God's standard. You all know who Jeff Bezos is, uh, the richest man in the world. I think the latest count is somewhere around $80 billion dollars. Hard to fathom, isn't it? Unimaginable for us. $80 billion, multiple times over. I am a thousand heir. <laughs> Last week, Tara and I went to, um, to Sandpoint and, uh, to get away for our anniversary, and we drove our 10-year-old Nissan, to Sandpoint. If Jeff Bezos was going to Sandpoint, would he drive? Maybe. Would he drive a 10-year-old car? No. Would he stay at the Best Western? We did. (laughs) And it was the Best Western. (laughs) Where would he stay? Not there. (laughs) We didn't see him. The idea is that we compare ourselves with others. It's not like Ben Orchard is to Jeff Bezos as Jeff Bezos is to God. No. Jeff and I, we're the same. We're on the same plane. In fact, I've been to countries traveling abroad and coming home and feeling guilty about how rich I am, how much I have. It's all relative. But there is a scale, there is a proportion of glory and abundance that belongs to God, and that is how we should scale our prayers. The point is, we ask for too little. We limit God just in our prayers and our faith. We don't ask Him to do big enough stuff. We are limited in this scale. Scale your prayers. Because He wants to grant you according to the riches of His glory. Because He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that you could ask or even dream up in a million years. He's able. And we pray for little minute things and we're, we put them in a box. The riches of His glory. That is how we should scale our prayers. According to who He is, not our puny little minds. 
So some things in application this morning. <clears throat> well, the first is our prayer team. We have a prayer team, and I said that in the two of the last three years, we have come back from our retreats, and we have said prayer is going to be our priority. But I have to confess to you, and I'm sorry to our prayer team, that we have not shepherded that team as we should. If prayer is as important as we're saying it is, why haven't we shepherded that team as well as we do the children's ministry and youth ministry and worship ministry? That's on me. That's on us. I'm sorry for that. We are all to pray. Christ commanded us to pray, taught us how to pray. But there's some of you that that's your thing. You are gifted in prayer. You are a prayer warrior. And I am, I am recruiting you this morning to the prayer team. I would like you to join the prayer team. And we're going to do better with our prayer team. In the bulletin, you'll see Pam Doy's name. There's a little, short little announcement, and there is a, her email address. And if you are interested in the prayer team, would you please contact her? Maybe you need to pray about it. Maybe some of you already this morning go, no, I'm ready. I see what you're saying, and I want to be part of the prayer team. I encourage you to that, to, to join the prayer team. Um, some months back, you know, I was in China, and um, on one of the Sundays that we were there, as it just turned out with our schedule and things going on, I went to a large international church by myself on Sunday morning, and Maybe some of you are aware of what international churches are. They're, they're all around the world. They're usually English-speaking churches where expats get together and they worship the Lord. And in China, it's a little bit different. This church in Beijing, many thousands of people, tens of thousands of people in this church. You wouldn't think about that, but they're not Chinese. They're Americans that are working in China. They are the people from the UK. These were English-speaking people from Australia, uh, the Philippines, and, and different places like that, Singaporeans, people who spoke English. And they come together, and they worship the Lord in this large church in the middle of Beijing, and the Chinese people can't go. In fact, to get in the door, you have to show your passport to demonstrate that you are not Chinese. So I'm sitting there, I got there about an hour early. I'm drinking some coffee, sitting in the foyer. And this place is like the INB, a little bit smaller, but it's a performing arts center, big stage, balcony. And I'm out in the foyer sitting there. And this man walks up to me, and he looks rather professorial. He's dressed in a corduroy jacket, and he was indeed a professor. He struck up a conversation with me. And he was an American, is an American, who has been in China for about 20 years teaching in a university. And he told me that he was part of the leadership team of this church, and his role was he was the leader of their prayer team. And I said, well, tell me about that. What do they, what do, they do like today? He said, well, today, their prayer team will be backstage. And they'll be back there, and they'll be praying the whole time. They can hear everything. You can't hear them. But they're behind the curtain. They can hear everything that's happening in the service. Think of that. People praying in real time when we're doing announcements and we're asking, we need volunteers for children's ministry. And the prayer team is saying, Lord, would you work in the hearts of the congregation and raise up those people? Praying for VBS, telling people it's coming up. And the prayer team at that moment is praying, Lord, would you bring children to, to salvation and their moms and dads? Fill this place with kids. When they're singing the song, praying, Lord, help our people to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, to sing with understanding, making melody in their hearts to you. And when the pastor is praying, Lord, give him memory, give him energy, help him to remember, help him to, to be full of your spirit, and, and may he preach the gospel. And Would you be working in the, in the hearts and the minds of all the people who are listening to understand your word and those who don't know Christ to come to know you? I covet that as a pastor, that we become a church of prayer like that, a house of prayer. So I encourage you to think about being part of the prayer team. 
also, just as a basic application of this passage, pray for God's glory in all things. That means you're depending upon His sovereignty, whatever it takes, Lord, whatever you want to do, I submit to you fully and completely. You know, the prince of of preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, an amazing man, had an incredible ministry in London. People would come and they would walk through his church during the week because it was a famous place, and he would take them on a tour. He would take them into the basement in the middle of the week to the prayer room, and in the middle of the week, in the prayer room, there were people on their knees praying for the ministry of the church, and Spurgeon would say, here is the powerhouse of the church. And I want that for Valley Bible Church, that the powerhouse of our church is prayer, a people of prayer. Our prayers will be fueled by the passion of God's glory as we understand that. Is the glory of God our greatest desire? Is that our greatest pursuit and passion at Valley Bible Church? I hope it is. If it is, then our prayers will be scaled to His glory. Our prayers will be aligned with His priorities and His purposes. And our prayers will be offered to our Heavenly Father in a relationship with Him. And now I invite you to your knees, if you can. I know some of you have bad knees, got new knees, old knees. But if you can, I invite you to your knees. If you can't, I understand. Father, we are grateful that we are your children and your saints. And I give thanks to you for the people of Valley Bible Church. And I pray that you as the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you. I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts and that having opened them, that we would know what is the hope of our calling, what are the riches of the glory of our inheritance with all the saints, and that we would know what is the surpassing greatness of your power toward us who believe. We know that these are in accordance with the working of the strength of your might, which you brought about in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And you put all things in subjection under your feet. And you gave Christ as a head over all things to us. To him be the glory, because we are his body and we are the fullness of Him. One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess, and we are bowing now, and we are confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.